So as a quick recap, we started our conversation on HVAC fundamentals, establishing this concept of an HVAC load and how they're sensible and latent components. Then we looked about how those loads are managed with things like HVAC processes and how we have tools like the site chart and different saturation diagrams to help us represent and quantify those HVAC processes. Then we discussed how the heat is essentially moved around the building to accomplish that process. So if we have loads that originate from a zone, we might have an airside system like an air handler or fan coil to capture those loads, kick them out to something like a chiller if it's a hydronic loop. If it's an air-cooled chiller, that would then be released to the atmosphere acting as a heat sink. Or if it's a water-cooled chiller, we would add in one more additional loop so that the cooling tower could accomplish that load rejection. We looked at how these HVAC devices are really comprised of heat exchangers. There's different ways to categorize that as direct and indirect and organized by fluid type. So recognizing the heat exchange devices specific to each system, we looked at HVAC equipment as well as the airside and pumping systems that move those loads around. So now we're going to get more into how to control these systems. And in addition to these devices to move the load around, we also need a number of input signals such as temperature or pressure. We need to have some output signals to things like valves and dampers and motor starters. And ideally this would all be done in an automated setting where we have the input signals running to a controller and being plugged into a sequence of operation that would then spit out an output command to the different HVAC devices in the system. So that's kind of a bare minimum for HVAC control systems. To do it well, we want to have the best sequences of operations that we can have, tight control loops. We want to have a good procurement process that gets us HVAC control systems that are QA'd well and can be managed by our O&M staff. We want to have open, supportable controllers that can talk to one another and be replaced easily. And we want to have some interface with the system so we can do things like monitor, override, and evaluate the performance. So let's start with some basic terminology. So what do we call this setup? Well, like most things in HVAC, it's really a system of systems. So at the bottom, we can look at these individual buildings as their own building control system. You might hear that term BCS or BAS, Building Automation System. And we really want to have local control at those buildings. But where we have a campus or installation environment, it would be really nice to have all of those buildings be interfaced at some central point. And we would call that the base-wide front end that has some enhanced interface performance to manage our systems better. And we really call this whole setup here the UMCS, or Utility Monitoring and Control System. So we're going to use terms like BCS and UMCS and front end to really understand where we are in this control system. So what do they do? At the simplest level, we're using commands like 0 to 10 volt or 4 to 20 milliamp electrical wiring to take in sensor readings or send output commands to devices like these. There's HVAC controllers that are taking in and sending out those input-output signals, but also are housing some control logic like this, so some sequence of operations that are represented here in logic block form. Some of our simpler controllers may not have that open programmable format, but they might have more of this wizard interface where there's pre-programmed or canned options for how you can change the settings and configurations of a simpler controller that's more of an application-specific setup like a VAV controller. Ideally we want to have some local interface or display panel like we see here that allows for limited viewing and overriding of specific key parameters. But really for that enhanced interface we need something like a UMCS front end. So this can be installed locally at a building but ideally it's overseeing a number of buildings where you have that campus environment. And there's a number of things we can do with, with a system like that. So the first thing we can do is scheduling. So having a really graphically easy way to build schedules and add them to specific systems or devices. 
we have this performance trending option where we can build some type of time series chart and add variables from our control system to it. So here's an example where we were looking at how the chiller motor operates relative to economizer temperatures. And we saw that while the chiller didn't come on, we had return air temperatures indicating that we had some scheduling problems overnight and on holidays. We had outside air temperatures where we were economizing or bringing in 100% outside air where we really shouldn't be causing unnecessary heating. And we had mixed air temperatures that indicated that the economizer dampers weren't stuck, but that they were only being told to bring in return air temperature for a small period in the early morning. So you can tell a lot from this type of performance trending and supplement where you don't have data points with portable data loggers. There's also a number of graphical screenshots that we see in these types of front ends. So we might have a floor plan level interface where we have something like multiple buildings that can be clicked and zoomed in. Maybe different parts of a building can, and this gives us something of a summary roll up so we can see at the zone level if our control system is doing ultimately what we want it to do and keeping folks happy at some space time set point. We can also have system level graphics. So here's an air side system represented in the schematic way and we saw last time how with the snapshot we can see maybe a couple key pieces of information like are we simultaneous heating and cooling on this airside system are economizer dampers doing what we think they should do so this can be very effective and it's also a platform to allow us to override certain set points and output commands temporarily for maintenance purposes we also have the option to alarm where we have a UMCS front end and we can create specific groups so that if an energy manager is interested in some performance issue at a building, informational alarms can be sent directly to him or her via email, where we have O&M technicians that may be more concerned with the start failure of key pieces of plant equipment. There might be a way to send text alerts directly to their mobile work phone. So how do these devices communicate within a control system? Well, we can look at kind of levels of complexity. So at the very bottom we have that simple electric wiring, 0 to 10 volt, 4 to 20 milliamp, that's going to and from sensors and actuators and HVAC controllers. Above that we can have protocol specific communication between HVAC controllers. We may also have some of that over IP. So if we have a specific protocol that's using not control wiring but something like Ethernet cabling we would call that having a specific protocol over IP. That IP at some point, if it's part of a central UMCS system, would have an interface where it would piggyback onto some base-wide network for further IP level communication, which would ultimately reside in something like a data center where the UMCS front end servers would live. There might be some type of interface with the outside internet and then some way to access and communicate inside that in some type of controlled way. So we can use these different tiers or levels to help understand the complexity of our system and what the cybersecurity implications might be. So you might see these types of hierarchies or riser diagrams that represent these different tiers, how these communication systems are effectively linked up and identify where some of your boundaries might be about ownership or cybersecurity concern. So we also worry about device interoperability. What does that mean? So there's a lot of different make and models that can have similar device capabilities, but may not play very well together. So what we want to do is have open bidding essentially, but avoid situations like this, where every building or subsystem has its own laptop and set of software and plugins and cables that allow you to interface and change or troubleshoot that particular system or building. So we can expect that this would heavily overburden an O&M staff and that we'd eventually have performance issues because of this difficulty in logistics of maintaining our systems. So the goal is an, an open UMCS. So what do we mean by that? There's a few features that we can talk about like ownership, who owns it, Essentially, we'd want the owner to be the one that 
can make decisions and can fully access their system and isn't dependent on a single contractor. But we want to have somebody, whether they're in-house or contracted, be available to readily work on the system, troubleshoot, or change it. We want to stay away from as much as possible proprietary elements in our control system. We want to be able to have multiple vendor devices communicating and being able to be easily replaced. And we want to have as many buildings as feasible integrated into a central front-end system. So we have different open protocols or different communication standards to help support this concept of openness. The two main ones that we can talk about would be LawnWorks and BACnet. So LawnWorks, or Lawn as it's generally referred to, uses the Lawn Talk communication standard. It has an organization called LawnMark that sets out specific device profiles, and it has a standard platform or database type called LNS. And those are some of the typical terminology that we'll see in a, in a Lawn system that we want to be comfortable with. For BACnet, it's got its own set of standards and organization and profile types. But there's also the Niagara framework, and this is somewhat of a different animal in the sense that we're still using LawnWorks or BACnet or some specific protocol at the building level, but what happens is that building level network would come into a Niagara framework supervisory gateway, sometimes referred by vendors as a JACE, that would then have a specific protocol that would go above that called FOX to your UMCS front end. So there's other open protocols out there, but the ones that are really supported right now on the whole building design guide are the BACnet Lawn and Niagara Framework types. So if you were to go on the whole building design guide, you would see that there's different control specifications and criteria that would help us in delivering these open systems where we have retrofit or new building opportunities. So on the specification side, we have this division 23 and 25, and we have different documents broken into different functions of our control system. So here a general spec for our projects. We have a separate spec for sensors and actuators, a different one for sequence of operations, and finally a separate specification for the protocol specific devices that we may use. Similar on the Division 25, which is for the UMCS, we have one for implementing UMCS, one for testing, and a separate one for cybersecurity. There's also design criteria that exists, and that's also broken up in a similar way here that can be accessed on the whole building design guide. So what makes for a successful UMCS or overall control system? Well, at the building level, we can look first at the sequences. We want to make sure we have energy efficient sequences that are only running systems equipment when we need to at the design points that they need and that those sequences of operations are able to be maintained by O&M staff. We want to have the right instrumentation and controllers to support those sequences done in an open way. We want to have software and interfaces that allow us to access the building level system in the ways that we need to. And we want to have the right roles and plans so that we have people and contingencies to know what needs to happen when the system needs to be worked on or changed. For the entire UMCS, we could look at this question of interoperability. How are we going to approach that? How can we maintain an open system? How can that system also be cyber secure? So do we need to accredit that system so that we're allowed to operate it in a specific configuration? Who's going to be using and accessing that system and when? And again, what are the plans for when that system goes wrong? Who are the IT contacts and the right people that need to be watching and notifying when the system loses connectivity or isn't operating the way that it should be? So that's our general overview for HVAC controls. And we're going to continue with another overview about the history of these systems and a little bit about the theory about what we're trying to accomplish with HVAC controls.